All right, now welcoming in on Tennis Channel Inside In, guest on today's show, uh, Blair Henley. You can find her literally everywhere across the tennis landscape. Uh, it's been a lot of things going on since the last time we've talked. Blair, one of my favorite guests on the show. Thank you for joining. I know you've been staying busy, and I appreciate you fitting time in your schedule to chat with me here on Inside In. Um, that just made my day that I am among your favorite guests, Mitch. It's always a pleasure. Good to be back. It, it, I, the pleasure is all mine, believe me. And uh, I, we have to talk about it. 2022, it's been a breakout year for many, a real breakout year for yourself too. Uh, we talked in, in January before the Australian Open. And since then, there's been a lot to catch up on. And I want to just go over some of the hits. I can't fit it all into one, but Boy, okay. there's a lot of different ones. Let's start with the uh, Dallas Indoor Tournament. You're hosting there. A former city, a former president is there and you're, you're just, you know, interacting, mingling with, you know, one of the less than 50 people that have run this country. That I talk about experiences I didn't expect to have going into my week working as an MC at a tennis tournament in Dallas. That was, that was one of them. Um, he, it was former president George W. Bush, um, big sports fan, likes tennis. And uh, he, I mean, gosh, it was, it was really, really neat. To have him there and he took the time to say hi to everyone from the ball kids to the janitorial staff literally so i he, he was just it was really nice to have him there and uh, bonus that i got to give him one of our giveaway towels and not get tackled by secret service in the process so yay me yeah we were worried about that i know they were pretty close closer than most get to the president um and another thing i wanted to bring up is uh indian wells a lot of Indian Wells content out there, but the pre-hit, you got the exclusive interview. One of the more insane things I've ever heard into a microphone was the interview with Paul Bedosa. So if you want to just, I mean, the, the, the countdown is on, like that's, that's all I'll say in, in terms of that interview. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I, I plan to see Paula in Cincinnati and that will be the first time I've seen her since the, the incident in question where at tie break tens, you know, I was working with Andrew Krasny and, and he always jokes around with the players. He knows the WTA players in particular very well. And he was joking about Simona being newly married and, uh, you know, said something to Arena Savalenka about about her boyfriend. That's generally territory that I stay away from. Obviously, tiebreak tens is, is loose and, and fun and, and more relaxed than most uh, tennis platforms. But, uh, you know, I just threw out there to Paula and she could have said anything. I said, you know, we've talked about, you know, married life or Simona Arena is in the market for someone, you know, anything personal you would like to share with us tonight. It wasn't necessarily yeah. boyfriend oriented. I, she could have gone anywhere with that. And she decides to throw up her hand and, and say she is waiting for a ring to be put on said hand and pointed to it. And I, I, I was kind of shocked. The crowd laughed. We all enjoyed it. And then afterward, she said, oh, he was watching. And he texted me right away and showed me her phone with the text from her was, boyfriend, Juan. It was serious. That was the thing that was, it was like a deadpan look into the camera. It wasn't like a laughing Thing. Exactly, exactly. But there is no ring as of yet. I plan to get an update on that in yeah. Cincinnati. So feel free to check back with me on uh, Paula Badosa ring watch. We will. That, that's on the top of the list. Um, <laughs> the biggest thing from Indian Wells for you and the TikTok video, I have to bring this up. And for those of you oh, on gosh. the video podcast, we're actually going to try to put some of this, splice some of this into the episode. But you did impressions with California Love in the background because it's at Indian Wells of a number of of a uh, different type of tennis players at the pro level and knocked it out of the park is an understatement it was uh, a hit across the boards For, first of all where does the genesis of this come from i know you've dabbled in this a few times but the attention to detail specifically you're very very well versed in the tennis world and it showed in the impressions of all these players oh man it was i actually went back and forth on on that and you can appreciate it i did one i, I did something similar about a year before a little over a year before um during the australian open quarantine where you know it was it, it was so i mean thinking back to that can i mean remember when there were Zoom calls and there were players leaking what was said on Zoom calls and everybody is stuck in their room for, for two weeks. Some are getting out for a few hours a day. Some are not. Everybody's upset. There are mice. 
there were so many things happening. And I, I, at that moment was just, I mean, there were so many caricatures of, of tennis players happening uh, right. in Australia that that was sort of when I first dipped my toe in because it was just, hopefully it was one of those, <laughs> those incidences that we will never see again in tennis, but it was just so bizarre that, that I was like, you know what, there's some content here to be had. How long did it take to put together? I mean, if you can pull back the curtain a little bit in terms of just the production side of things. <laughs> well, for, for the Australian Open one, I did most of it in this little office that I'm sitting in now. And um, my husband and my daughters like saw me walking by with like props. Um, so like a mustache on, a colander to use as the coupe de mousquetaires. <laughs> I, I had many a prop because, you know, you had to make this room work for multiple different players. Um, I got some raised eyebrows from my family mm -hmm. and definitely had many thoughts of, I might be too old for this, but it was the love of good content and different content that won out. And that was what inspired me to uh, dust off the TikTok account and do it again before Indian Wells. And again, it's a fine line because in what I do, I never want to be seen as making fun right. of anyone. Um, and so it's just more pointing out those things that the players are known for. Riley Opelka loves art. We're going to have him staring at some art on the grounds at Indian Wells or Cam Nori is the most faithful zinc sunscreen user I've ever seen in my life. And so these are things we know about these players and we love about them. And so I always try to stick to the know and love category versus no. And sometimes, you know, scratch our heads. Did you hear about, any? Cause yeah. those exist as well. Oh yeah. Uh, did you hear any feedback from any of the players that you put in the video? Um, probably the one I heard most from was, was Chris Eubanks. Who was that was very, the best one. That, that, I'm, I'm going to pick my shot here. That was the best one. He was, he was very thrilled uh, to be involved and, and sort of in including Chris, I also included Naomi and Coco and Serena sort of peripherally. And I can tell you that two of the three thought it was hilarious. Naomi and Coco. Coco told me to my face. She's like, I love the TikTok. And uh, via Chris, I know that Naomi also got a kick out of it. So I will take that as all the positive feedback I will ever need in my life. Such a funny video. I encourage everyone to check it out. Uh, and just kind of going off that, you've kind of occupied or you are occupying a unique lane in the tennis world. You're on court emceeing work in the Hall of Fame event, which we'll get to in a second, putting out some video and some content as well. Did you see yourself kind of in this lane in tennis? It's different. It's all your own, which is good. But this is something that, you know, you are kind of a trendsetter in a way. Well, thank you. I don't know that I see myself that way, but I definitely always want to push myself and push those around me, sort of the gatekeepers to trust me to try to do different things um, because it's just so funny even now looking towards Cincinnati and obviously I'm going to be there doing some of the digital content for the Cincy team but I'm also helping out with digital content for the USTA team and there's going to be a tennis TV team there and WTA digital is going to be there and ATP their production um, group is going to be there and and that's just the official entities in in the game that's not even including anyone else who might want to come in and create some sort of content, any of the local outlets. So it's it's becoming much harder uh, to do things that look and sound and and are different. Um, and it's it's hard in the social game. I mean, you know, it's like yeah. you're you're only as good as your last idea. Uh, and and just trying to figure out, you know, uh, for instance, I'll just give you a look at, at what we're we're pondering for Cincinnati. We did a concept last year there um, called compliment cards where we had players on the ATP tour compliment players on the WTA tour and vice versa. And at the time I was thinking to myself, how are we gonna get this past the people who say yes and no to these things? First the comms teams on tour and then also agents. And thankfully there's, there's, I think a little bit of trust there and, and the people on the ATP and WTA comms teams were like, like, I don't, I don't really get it, but you can give it a shot. And then once they saw it in action and thankfully it worked and the players bought into it yeah. and everybody was on board, but, but sort of thinking of something like that and then convincing other people 
that it's going to work because you have no idea. That is the one thing that I've learned from doing social content. You could have something that you think is a brilliant idea that falls flat on its face and nobody sees. And you could have a one-off. It's not even a segment. It's something a player does when they, I don't know, are sitting down in the chair to get mic'd up or they can't mic themselves or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And that could be the thing that gets, you know, hundreds of thousands of views on social media. And so there's just no recipe for greatness. And so really, you know, trying to sell something that I myself don't know if it's for sure going to work. That's scary because then you feel like, you know, if people doubt you, then you feel like you better deliver. And so this year in Cincy, I, you know, thinking of it, like, say you go on the Jimmy Fallon show, there are certain segments, uh, you know, the wheel of voices or what's in the box or whatever it is. I believe that's a Fallon one as well. Yeah. Um, there are certain segments that they have where players can come in and they sort of know what's expected of them and, and they have fun with it. And so this year, I think we might actually do a couple more compliment card segments because last year there were a players, a lot of players who weren't in Cincy and B we didn't necessarily shoot high, high because we didn't know how it was going to work out. Right, so right. Now that we know that the, the players seemingly enjoyed it, had fun with it, got the concept. Um, we thought, you know, there might be more legs here. So I think we might do a few more of those. And so it, it's trying to figure out like, do we try to reinvent the wheel this year? Do we try to make a slight adjustment to something else that's worked? It's just, it's a, it's a lot of throwing things out there and just seeing what sticks. Building up that equity though, gives you the opportunity to try stuff and have, you know, agents or player reps be like, oh, I'm not sure if this works, but we trust you and what you've done. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they say that sometimes they don't, uh, but I appreciate the times when they do. Uh, well, I, I just appreciate all this stuff and, and different content creation. Uh, keep up with the Instagram, uh, like story time, what would it be? Story time lessons. I'm <laughs> referencing like the Harmony Tan doubles yes. drama at, at uh, Wimbledon, just to kind of let casual fans or just people that are checking in at tennis in the majors or different times, the behind the scenes drama. So that was a good lesson. A uh, couple Instagram story slide there explaining the beef and the drama. Yeah. Sometimes there are just stories that I'm like, this needs to be shared with the greater sports world. Um, people who might not otherwise care about tennis. Right. And I don't know, in general, I feel like tennis, I wish tennis did more of that. And I don't, again, I don't know. I don't have the solution. Like what's the best way to do that? I don't know. Um, yeah. But I do think I'm definitely on the train of sort of marrying the broadcast world and the digital world just a little bit more yeah. I still think they are largely two very separate things in a lot of people's minds and I don't think that they have to be no I agree I think it's it's a tough complex issue it's not really there's no real manual on how to do it but any way you can kind of blend it, it's good and you also have to kind of keep keep your uh you know keep the uh, value of anonymity like the the Billie Jean King Cup party I know you put the video up of them dancing jumping around but I'm sure it got even more crazy when the cameras went off. So they probably <laughs> were good I, to share everything. I have no doubt. Yes, there's always uh, an element of discretion involved for sure. More with Blair Henley here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Well, well let's talk about the Hall of Fame a couple of weeks ago. You uh, were MC of the event itself on the uh, court for on-player interviews. Uh, Leighton Hewitt was enshrined. The tournament itself just wanted to start there. Top 10 player in Felix shows up. Andy Murray, future Hall of Famer by all accounts, shows up. So the event, the tournament itself, as was bigger and better, uh, arguably, than any iteration of it in the last couple of years. So that had to add some juice to the grounds as well. Uh, as Stan Smith likes to say about how the courts in Newport used to be, and I quote, they were an embarrassment. Okay. And... <laughs> and and listen, right. if, Stan, if Stan Smith yeah. says it, it must be true. Uh, but, it, and all the players will say too, you know, if you were coming to Newport two years ago and beyond, and, and again, my experience there is only, what, six, about six years, um, you had to come in with a certain mental outlook. You were going to get some bad bounces. You probably weren't going to, there weren't going to be a lot of great rallies. Mm -hmm. um, you just had to come in knowing that. Now that they have resurfaced the grass, it is it is no joke. It's really fun tennis. And I think too, even with like an Andy Murray who has a metal hip, having an extra week on grass 
for a lot of players is something that I, that I think a lot of them are, would have enjoyed prior, but now are considering it because they've heard, Oh, Hey, they've got some great grass there now. Um, yeah. That was the first thing that Felix said to me when I, when I asked, you know, and, and obviously there are things that happen behind the scenes that make it more uh, appealing for players to show up at various tournaments, but great, a great surface and, and good grass and a great location. I mean, Felix lost uh, his opening match and ended up staying in Newport four plus extra days. So I, I think that more and more top players are going to find that an appealing tournament to go to much to the dismay of some of the other lower ranked players who sometimes snuck into the main draw in Newport, who might not have that chance going forward. Did you uh, end up you know, you and uh, Bublik going to get Chipotle after the event? Oh, my goodness. I, it does not matter how soft the softball that you lob to yeah. Alex Bublik. He will find a way to, uh, I don't know if swing and miss is, is the way to describe it. He, he, maybe, maybe a foul ball, you know, into somebody's noggin in the stands. <laughs> I, yeah, I feel like it's like a he's just gonna he's gonna go his own direction. Like everybody's running track one way, he's just gonna go the other way. Like he, he's on his he's own path. The, the, he's swimming upstream, that's for sure. Um, and and that's the way he likes it. Um, I will say from my perspective, I have to be on my toes. And I think I I I mean I did three interviews with him. He was booed in two out of the three. And and guys, I'm not asking. <laughs> hard hitting questions out there. We're, Is that the trophy presentation? Cause that was a little spicy too. Uh, yes. I was not counting the trophy presentation because I did not actually ask any questions there, but, but yes. So really if we're counting that, it would be three out of four where, where things maybe weren't as, um, you know, buttercups and roses as they could have been. Um, and I don't know, some part of me feels that he doesn't have to be quite that contrary. Uh, a little bit of, of be, you know, I'm happy for somebody to have to go their own way to march the beat of their own drummer, but but there's also a line where it becomes maybe slightly less enjoyable. Usually that's enjoyable. That I mean, I I love a player who is unique, uh, but but there is a line where it becomes maybe less so, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, he's one of a kind, and I know there's good and bad with that, but uh, definitely something that adds another element to the game. Uh, what was the actual weekend like in terms of Leighton Hewitt's induction? Did it have an Auss Aussie feeling? Uh, seeing his legendary coach come in and surprise him was good. What was the uh, enshrinement process like in the weekend, like honoring uh, Rusty into the Hall of Fame? Uh, it was it's just it's so special every year and I can't remember somebody was saying this at it might have been Todd Martin um might have been Brett Haver who was hosting but what what makes it in part so special is because so many other hall of famers come to celebrate like if, if you didn't have all of that you know if you didn't have Stan Smith coming back even though he's not the president of the hall of fame anymore he stepped down at the end of last year Tracy Austin or Andy Roddick going up on stage during the enshrinement dinner and like breaking down matches with Leighton Hewitt. That is so cool. And there's just nothing like it. I, it's so funny. I ran into a fan who uh, won a contest in 20 at the beginning of 2020, uh, picked the ATP cup bracket and won a ATP cup bracket contest won a trip to the next year's Australian Open, obviously could not go. And they said, what other tournament would you like to go to? And they, he and a friend picked the Hall of Fame Open. And not only did they get to go to the tournament, they got to go to the enshrinement dinner, the induction Smart. itself. It Smart. was a brilliant choice. And he was like, this is so much better than, than the Australian Open would have been for two random guys walking around the grounds. And it's because the access and the history and it's just, I can't really describe it, but all I would say is it's my favorite week on the tournament calendar for a reason. If you have a chance to go, you have to make it happen. There's just no place like Newport. I, I couldn't agree more with that. It's uh, it's good to see. Uh, we'll see who the in inductees are in the next couple of years. Cause it might be a little tough, but we'll have to see uh, the, the last we'll thing. Sparse. We'll we'll sparse. Sparse. Last thing on the hall of fame. 
what kind of game does Kirk Cousins have on the court? Uh, so I have to say he has a 92% forehand game is how I would describe <laughs> yeah, it. Right. He's a quarterback. He uses, you know, the right arm. So <laughs> there you go. But I did think um, it was pretty cool to hear him say that that's a training method. And, and, you know, he acknowledges, look, I'm not the most fleet of foot, you know, compared to NFL athlete wise, but tennis has gotten him to a point where he feels better about his fitness. Yes, I love that. And I love, you know, he said considered basketball, but the the injury risk was too great. So listen, I think it's it's fantastic. There have been other players along the way. Um, Dirk Nowitzki was one who famously played tennis in his off seasons for as a part of his cross training. Um, and listen, anyone who's played tennis at a at a decently high level knows that it's, it's intense, especially in the summer. So yes, I saw a whole lot of forehands. Um, he moved pretty well though. He looked like a tennis player on the court, which is more than I can say for, for some crossover athletes. And I love, I love any sort of crossover action. A plus. I feel like that Michael Scott clip where you're like, Oh, you know, who else had a forehand heavy game, Rafael Nadal, Walmart, <laughs> and Del Potro. So yeah. I love it. It's good. It's good to see. Well, as we kind of segue into the current tournaments, the summer hard court swing now is finally really upon us here. We've had Atlanta last week, DC, San Jose, uh, Los Cabos this week. Uh, we're going to spend some time talking about San Jose, but I just wanted to mention the city open and, and it's insane today with the rainouts. There's just tennis all across the ground. It's hard to keep up on what round it is, but how excited and optimistic are you looking forward to this really crash course run? It's only about six weeks and then we'll five, six weeks and we're going to be all the way through it. So it's going to, you know, it's zero to a hundred as the kids say right away. <laughs> I love it. I love that I can turn the TV on at just about any point in the day and there will be some tennis. My kids love that. Um, they know that they don't ever get to watch TV while they eat except for when there's tennis on. And so of course they're like, is there tennis on? And I'm like, as a matter of fact, <laughs> there is <laughs> tennis always, on today yeah. and there will be for the next, you know, six or so weeks. Um, no. So I think it's the absolute best. It's always interesting sort of at the beginning, some players are, are still playing their first few matches back after taking a little bit of a break. Always interesting to sort of take the temperature as far as levels are concerned. Nice to see Naomi Osaka back who, Honestly, for the time she was away played, I don't, I, it shouldn't surprise me at this point that she can come out and play really competent tennis after taking yeah. <laughs> weeks and weeks off. It's amazing to me. I couldn't do it, but she is, is specially wired. And that match against Coco was, was something else last night. There's no breaks in the schedule. Even the clay court swing, there's like kind of down periods and it ebbs and flows a little bit. So you have just tournaments every week, even the week before a couple 250s now. So it is interesting to see how the players manage their schedule, take the temperature, as you said, the heat in DC, it's just been brutal all week in addition to the rain, the humidity. So managing the schedule is the, is the big point. The San Jose tournament, we are recording this on Friday morning, right after uh, Osaka and Coco golf played. A two-set match that was straight sets for Coco, but Naomi did show a lot, down 5-1, saving seven match points. Realistically speaking, I think this is too, this is a good result for Naomi in the sense that where, I mean, she's going to have to play a lot of tennis. to Like, you can't get great at tennis without playing tennis. So the fact that she's able to come back, play well, show some fight in some down moments where she could have basically checked out and taken that exit stage left, I think it's a good sign for her because Coco is a bona fide top 10 player. And the expectations for me being that it's going to come with time in terms of getting your A game back. It's, it's hard to just waltz back into elite level tennis. I was, I was thinking about this the other day and thought it was just so ironic. I, I listened to her post-match interview, Naomi's after beating uh, Zhang Chinwen, and, and she was talking about her dad and looking at her dad and talking about how great it was to be back with him and was just beaming. And there was a joy there that we want to see with Naomi, but haven't always seen. And how ironic is it? So often we're like, mm, having the parent as the coach, that is a terrible idea. And now Naomi has sort of come full circle. She's back with her dad and we're all like, this seems like the greatest thing ever, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think, I think with Naomi, the big thing is enjoying the process, enjoying tennis when she's having fun out there her apex is still arguably the best in women's tennis. 
there's been some stuff that's happened in the last year that the love of the game has been questioned. I don't want to say it's gone, but it has been questioned. So if she's enjoying herself out there and she's committed to a reasonably full schedule with the way the landscape is for women's tennis, I think she's going to be a factor very soon. I happen to have this quote in front of me because I retweeted it this morning from my friend Courtney Nguyen of WTA insider fame, but Osaka, Naomi was talking about saving seven match points. And she said, quote, when I was playing, I realized I've been letting people call me mentally weak for so long that I forgot who I was. I lost today, but I feel really confident in who I am. I feel like the pressure doesn't beat me. I am the pressure. I'm really happy with that. And I just thought that that was a mic drop quote and also a quote that should strike fear into the hearts of all potential <laughs> opponents yeah. for, from here on out for the, it's certainly for the hard, hard court swing. It should. Uh, and the only thing being like you were saying with other, like you're, you're as good as your last match. So let's see, keep playing, keep building on it, but I'm with you. I think that if this keeps going, she'll be just fine and back and it's good to see her out there for Coco. I mean, this is, this is somebody that's played a lot of high quality tennis this year. It keeps the keeps getting better. And I actually think in a weird way, how she managed herself after squandering all those match point chances shows a lot about where she's come because not just her, but a lot of players would have unraveled there having squandered seven match points. We've seen it time and time again, but she kept her head in it and was able to serve it out. I mean, the word maturity is so often used uh, in relation to Coco and it's true on the court, off the court. And what I like with Coco is that there is just a consistent upward trajectory. She might have a misstep or a match where she's a little bit negative, but you know, and same thing on her forehand. It's always been the talk. Well, her forehand can leak errors. It previously, it was her serve that, that had some, some weak spots, but she has, made adjustments on the serve. The forehand is becoming more and more solid. Her mental game on court has improved dramatically. I mean, I think back to Roland Garros, uh, not this year, the year before, so 2021. And yeah. she, in that loss, I, I believe she lost to Krejcikova. I mean, there were, there were rackets being thrown. She was She looked on the verge of tears for a lot of that match. Uh, I just think she has come a long way in terms of progress in literally every portion of her game. So one step at a time, I mean, she's going to be knocking on the door of, of the very top. I mean, she, she is already, but I know she wants to get just that little yeah. bit more. Two French opens ago, she loses first round to Trevason. Uh, all those double faults beats her pretty handily. This French okay. open to get to the final last year, you were right. It was Krejcikova in the, in the quarterfinals. My point being that there's there's a void right now in the women's game at the top, and Coco's showing all signs that she could be, and she wants to be the one to assume not just top 10. Now we're talking top five. Now we're talking top three. The opportunity is there. The game's there. And I agree. At, at her point in her career, her age, she's gotten progressively better. There's no reason to think that the progress will slow down. It's an exciting time of year in terms of what to expect. And I think going into New York, she has got to be on the short list of players that you could easily see winning seven matches. Yeah, she thrives on the crowd energy too. And side note, she looks like a star. That New Balance kit, I cannot get enough. Her own CG shoes, the CG ones. I mean, it's it just, she checks every star box. Absolutely love that for her. Don't know what that's like, but I... I mean, she's no doing kids. it well. She's doing it well. <laughs> a few more things with Blair Henley on Tennis Channel Inside In. Uh, the rest of the, of the San Jose field, pretty exciting to say the least. Um, there's a big match coming up today with Shelby Rogers and Amanda Anisimova, two Americans that are playing some of their best tennis. Uh, Amanda Anisimova is looking like a top 10 player, and she's really, this is the this is the breakthrough year that we've all kind of expected from her in terms of consistency starting with beating Naomi in Australia, but where she's backed it up every step of the way. And she is consistently proving that it's not a fluke week in week out. I, I think that she's someone that having her best year consistently by a mile, but is also showing that she's got weapons that a lot of these ladies on the WTA don't have. Uh, she has the capability to hit people off the court, which as we saw from Elena Rabakina, if you can, take the racket out of the opponent's hand that can work out very well for you. If everything happens to come together over the course of 
uh, five, six, seven matches. But I, I think the symmetry is interesting, Mitch. She's ranked 22 right now. And when you look back to just before the 2019 US Open, where she it was just so horribly sad, ended up pulling out because her her father tragically passed away. She was ranked 21 at the time. And I, we all thought, you know, she would I mean at the time people were thinking she could have won, you know, gone in and been a dark horse to win the U S open. And uh, obviously uh, as her dad was her coach. And so that, that may even affect you on, on a more significant level in terms of your profession being tennis. Um, and she said, she's grown a lot. And here we are back at, 22 in the world heading into the U S open. And I, I just hope for the best for her because I cannot imagine how brutal that must have been to, to get back on her feet in the sport where her dad had been alongside of her since she was the, since she could pick up a racket. Um, so yes, in the grand scheme, love her game, but also sort of love to see the full circle, uh, resurgence. Yeah, 2019, she was a French Open semifinalist and was trending up and then, you know, life hit unexpectedly. But to get back where she is, still super young, uh, an opportunity there. And I've always maintained that I haven't spent nearly as much time on the tournament grounds as you have. She, she was one of the best. If you just watch practice players, how they hit, it's strikingly good. Like it's the, the ball striking is clean and she's always been at the top of the list. So Props to her. I, I brought up Shelby Rogers as well. She's gotten in the best shape of her life and it's, it's showing results on the court and that match should be fun today. Uh, Shelby beat in her early round matchup, Bianca Andrescu, which unfortunately, you know, for us as tennis fans, isn't quite at the level fitness wise with some injuries that she's had to get back on track. And I'm worried because like a lot of people, I want to see her play more, but this has been a reoccurring thing at tournaments. So I wonder how she manages her body and her health going forward. Uh, some people are just unlucky and Andrescu, when it comes to the injuries, there's, there's a little bit of Delpo mm -hmm. in, in her trajectory. And that is just such a bummer. And I don't think it's anything that, that she's doing. I mean, she's, she seems to be putting in the work, um, training with some of the best and sometimes certain bodies just don't mm. care as well on tour. It's, it's brutal out there and some bodies adjust better than others. And, and I, it's just such a bummer for her. And hopefully that's not just not to write off the rest of the hard court swing. Uh, she could come out and, and play great tennis in the next few weeks, but it is concerning for sure. Yeah. We just want to see her out on the court. Um, if there's any tweaks to her game to style play to, to mitigate some of these injuries, we're sure she'll try it, but yeah, just unfortunate heading into her home tournament, which she's won before the Canadian open next week. Uh, another name I wanted to just bring up as well, playing great tennis, but also doing great things. Uh, Daria Kazakina, um, playing great tennis has beaten a lot of top players is into the quarterfinals of San Jose, big match with Sablanca today. You know, also publicly came out, which has to be, you know, it's props to her for a lot of reasons, but for doing it in the climate she's in in Russia, uh, has to be carrying a lot on her plate, but also still playing good tennis and still being, you know, a top 10 in the year end points race at the WTA. So she's backing it up as well. Uh, Kazakina is somebody that I do think where people kind of forgot about and still is a threat to just about anyone on the WTA tour. Mm -hmm. She, I was at the WTA finals in 20. I am the worst with years, Mitch, something you should know about me when I'm like 20 something. Okay, um, no, was it 2018? That, that is correct. She yeah. was an alternate for the WTA finals. Uh, and so, yes, to your point, she has shown over the years that she is capable of, of beating the absolute best in the world and, and doing it in a creative way fashion that you a game style you might not see every day which I personally love um so to see her doing that more consistently makes me very very happy and yeah it's interesting it makes me wonder you, you I think you use the phrase she's caring a lot I wonder if maybe she feels like she's caring less now um in some ways I a huge props to her as you said for for going public with something that can have massive repercussions in Russia um, but I hope that she's feeling lighter after that. Um, and so maybe that can sort of counteract 
the criticism I'm sure she's received. I hope she's also, it seems like she's also received a lot of love, but it's a little bit different. I think when, you know, you, you saw in that piece where, where she talked about like maybe not being able to go home Mm -hmm. and just, you know, bursting into tears and breaking down. And so there's, there's a heaviness maybe beyond what, what we would normally consider, but awesome for her and, and for not being afraid to, say what was on her mind and say it to a journalist. That's something we don't see very often. That's, it's one of a couple of Russian journalists who seem to really have gotten the trust of the players. And it was nice, I think, the way that that whole thing was, was handled. Well, her record against the top 10 is unreal good. Well, so I think that that's the part where I've always been impressed by her is mm-hmm. maybe even a little curious, like, like she raises her level against the top players and we we're glad to see her on the mix. And Love it. I guess I guess the last thing I'll ask you as we we end is with this. We're going into the run of the US Open and both sides have some uncertainty. The the Canadian Open is not going to have any member of the big three. Uh there's the Russian players back trying to gain their momentum on the women's side. We are still trying to figure out the pecking order. There's a lot of threats going into all these tournaments. So how do you see, you know, this shaking out the momentum building and, and starting with Canada? Do you see there being a path to some players kind of separating themselves from the field and uh, assuming some top positions here. Where I'm sitting right now, no. I I think whoever wins DC is whoever wins San Jose is whoever wins Toronto. And I think it could be someone different in every spot. That's, and that's I think, a Rafa quote. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And here we are. Yeah. We are at the US Open. Yeah. Um, no, I, I just, I don't think there's necessarily going to be any more clarity going into the, you know, the, the day before the US Open starts than we have yeah. right now. Um, and I think we've seen too that, playing with some wind behind your back. So even if they're they're obviously confidence is a great thing. Um, but with that usually comes some pressure and there are a lot of, in particular before slam in particular, even maybe before the U S open, there's so much pre-tournament press. And when you have had a good lead up and everybody is saying to you, well, you had a great, you know, Canadian Open, you had a, had a great uh, Cincinnati. I think that it's really easy to have, having to talk about it a lot is, is not, is not the easiest thing in, in my. That's so true because yeah. you look at, you look at, I mean, the men's side showed some, I mean, comparative to the other majors, some opening up a little bit, but the women's side, I mean, we've seen so many first time major champions in the last five, seven years. It's been ridiculous. Radha Khan, you Sloan Stevens and Drescu. Naomi won her first major here. So I do think that, yeah, going into it, it's almost better to be lurking and like just survive the first week, give yourself a chance to get into the round of 16 and then things could happen. It's so true. I I don't want to, I don't want to just completely, you know, gloss over momentum. I don't think it's necessary that you play your best tennis and even win or come close to winning some of these tournaments. But I do think getting reps in, getting matches in, winning a couple rounds does help you. Rada Khan, you played, played a 125 last year, had the Wimbledon run. I know it wasn't much on the hard courts, but Sloan's year, she had done well going into the U.S. Open. She won and Drescu won the, won the Rogers Cup at the time, now the Canadian Open. So I think it's, it's good in a sense to get some match play, show some signs. But yeah, going into the tournament, we're going to be like, well, we'll see what happens because the fields are deep. <laughs> Yes, that's that's setting myself up when people ask me, like, so who's your pick for the U.S. Open champion? And I'll be like, I have absolutely no idea. I'm going to pick a dark horse, though, because nobody will remember it if I say Rafa Nadal is going to win. But if I pick, you know, Yoshihito Nishioka, yeah. people are going to be like, Blair called that. That's pretty amazing. She must know a lot about tennis. <laughs> Yeah, it's and you know last year as we as we just kind of wrap up here, you know, Canadian Open was won by Medvedev on the men's side and Camilla Georgi on the women's side. So you you can go across the board and say there's been some strange Masters winners across here, or like that's the beauty of sports and not knowing. Sometimes it was a future star in the making. We just had no idea how good that they could possibly be. So I'm I'm curious to see where this goes. This is the final, you know, major major run of the season. So we like to think, and we're seeing that players have gotten themselves in their best shape, best form, given themselves all the potential in the world to just play their best. Mm -hmm. A lot of these Americans, especially their home slam. So I think anything can happen here. And that's why we're glued to our TVs literally every day until mid-September. 
I cannot wait. Um, love that there are so many Americans in the mix. I think that's particularly fun heading into the U.S. Open because although the, although the American crowd has been occasionally criticized for not appropriately getting behind the home players, there is still an element of buzz when an American player gets on the court, and that is a special thing to be a part of. Certainly is. Uh, Blair Henley, uh, appreciate you coming on. Where can we find you next? Is it Cincinnati? Is that the next stop? I'll be in Cincy. Yep. So I will, I'm going to do my best to keep the social game strong. So okay. hopefully I'll have some hashtag content for you. Good to know. Good to, good to monitor that. I'll put that in my, uh, my checklist there. Um, we also want to see just the, the last thing we want to see the, uh, side by side with, uh, Matt Ebden and JJ Wolf who's playing pretty good now in, uh, in the city open. So I want the mullet mullet feature. So I'll just add that. Oh my me. gosh. Yes. Well, we, yes. Max Purcell. I, I feel like, I don't know. I hope I just hope he doesn't get any ideas mm -hmm. okay. I think about cutting off the mullet because JJ has cut off the mullet and is now doing very well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, this is a breakthrough tournament into the top 100. I think the mullet got him here. So I don't think it was <laughs> that's true. You really can't well. forget, can't forget the mullet's place in history. Great point, Mitch. Laura Henley, thank you so much for uh, again joining Tennis Channel Inside In. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Mitch.